turtle evolution is kind of a problem. And the thing is, we can tell pretty distinctly they're amniotes. They lay hard-shelled eggs with an amnion. This became the fluid inside the womb in animals that give life birth. However, in this case though, we can also say they're reptiles. They have beta-keratin skin and produce urates instead of urine. That's the white part of poop from things like lizards and even birds. But the problem with turtles and where it gets confusing is really in the skull. Because when you look at reptiles, they're largely diapsids, which means essentially they have two separate openings for muscle attachments on each side of the skull. There's the upper and lower temporal fenestra. Meanwhile, in mammals and mammal relatives, they only have one of these. Unfortunately, though, when you look at a turtle skull, you'll realize it doesn't have any of these, which is really, really frustrating. If that's the main thing we use to group these animals together, suddenly this major feature just doesn't exist in the turtles. And this likely was lost through evolution, and fortunately we have fossils of other animals, including reptiles, that also lost these features. Most notably, in this case, the para-reptiles, which include things like the Pereosaurs. If you're interested, you can check out my Scutosaurus video. Some of the Pereosaurs, like Scutosaurus, also had armor and osteoderms growing in their skin. So, potentially, they were the stem turtles, and this was what was believed for a long time. Unfortunately then, more things got involved that made it harder to say that with great certainty. That said, you can look at certain figures, like this one from a paper on Chinle Chellis, a late Triassic turtle coming from the Chinle formation of the southwestern United States, and you can kind of see how this idea makes sense, at least superficially. You can see kind of the large armored Scutosaurus into the smaller Procolophonids, which are related to things like Scutosaurus, and then you can move into more and more modern turtles all the way up to the modern day. The problem with Chinle Chellis is it's not super complete, and also there's only one specimen, so we are missing a lot of detail. However, during the Triassic, there's also things like Progana Chellis, which comes from Germany and is very clearly a turtle and known from a lot of good specimens. One of the really interesting things about this Procolophonid idea is the fact that the Procolophonids are the only group of parareptilians to actually make it past the Permian-Triassic extinction the most devastating extinction in Earth's history where up to 75% of life on land died out. At least some of the Procolophonids were also fossorial, meaning they burrowed a lot. And while it's really easy to go, oh, well, turtles swim, they don't burrow, think about things like desert tortoises. They burrow pretty adeptly. And the thing is, turtles are pretty diverse, at least when you look at their different niches today. You have entirely marine species, some species that spend their entire lives in freshwater. You have soft-shelled turtles with semi-permeable skin, almost like amphibian skin. You also have desert tortoises and even box turtles, including things like the Sonoran box turtle, which lives in very similar places as certain types of desert tortoise, but they don't necessarily directly compete with one another. There's a lot of diversity in what turtles can do. This is also where another idea for their evolution has come into play, because potentially they were more aquatic when they were first evolving. And if that's the case, that means they might actually be related to other water reptiles, especially marine or aquatic reptiles from the Mesozoic Things like the early plesiosaurs, which would be entirely different than being parareptilians. And while the plesiosaurs aren't necessarily perfectly nailed down themselves as to what they're related to, it's very likely they're closely related to the archosaurs, so things like crocodilians and dinosaurs, or potentially they're closely related to things like lizards. And that would at least put turtles into a modern day group. This is where the fossil of Chinle Chellis becomes very inconvenient, because it would be great to have some evidence on its limbs so that we can understand what it might have been doing with those limbs if it was walking around and burrowing, or if it was swimming. And this paper actually puts out an entire graph that shows some of these distributions, along with some organisms which could fall into different places in it and might be closely related to turtles. There's also been other papers that have looked at things like Proganochellus to kind of see what it would have been doing. And unfortunately, it's been described as both something that was totally terrestrial and lived on land, and something that was more aquatic to semi-aquatic. And that's based on different studies, one looking at the shape of the shell and the carapace, and the other looking at the bone histology, essentially how was the bone in the shell made up. As for the limb lengths, most of these other early turtles, or potential early turtles, seem to fall well within the range we would expect of modern turtles. Although again, more towards the kind of semi-aquatic side of it, which kind of suggests that maybe they aren't related to Procolophonids. If only there was some kind of new technology that could actually help to answer where they might be closest related to, because that could answer a lot of these questions. And fortunately, we're not cavemen, we have technology. And by that I mean we can look at genes and try and understand how distantly different groups are related. That's because certain parts of genomes aren't under constant direct evolutionary pressure and change more randomly just through random mutations. 
And while it's not super, super discreetly planned out exactly what these times could have been, there are chances of mutations that can track pretty well, which means we can make a range of when different groups would have split from one another. And what this paper was able to do is actually go, hey, turtles, pretty closely related to the archosaurs. So again, things like crocodilians and also the dinosaurs. This is also very important when you consider the para-reptilians. The para-reptilians split off as far back as the early Permian, which means essentially they're very, very early reptiles. If turtles came from this group, you would expect the divergence times from other reptiles to be as far back as the early Permian, and instead it's the late Permian, which is when it's believed most of the early archosaur forms were actually splitting off from one another. This could make some level of sense. Turtle skulls aren't necessarily super flexible and neither are other archosaur skulls, at least early archosaur skulls from things like early crocodilomorphs and early dinosaurs. They instead had an akinetic skull. To compare this to something like a lizard, they more distinctly have bones in their skull that can move relative to one another. This is most dramatic in snakes, which can do absolutely incredible stretching and movement of skull bones because they have a very unique eating mechanism. A number of early archosaurs were also armored. They had osteoderms, so it seems like a pretty straightforward step to go from some of those osteoderms into the very derived osteoderms that we see in turtle skeletons. But no other animal has a modern day shell like a turtle does. That's because when you look at things like crocodilians, sure, there's osteoderms, there's bones growing in the skin, but they're mostly separate from the skeleton, not directly the skeleton itself. Meanwhile, in turtles, it's literally the ribs that have expanded and gotten wider, and on the belly, it's the belly ribs, gastralia, that have done the same, and that's able to enclose the entire animal. Unfortunately, now we have those other fossils that I was talking about that seem like they could be even closer to stem turtles, and that's things like Papochelis, Odontochelis, and Unotosaurus. And Unotosaurus is a bit controversial because it's not as well preserved as we might like, and some people have even suggested it could be a synapsid, meaning more closely related to mammals than to reptiles. However, it also comes back from about the right time where the first turtles would have been splitting off from other reptiles. We can even potentially see some of this change happening in these animals, with Unotosaurus, especially the young ones, having these very prominent fenestra, but then in things like Papochelis, you can see the lower fenestra is actually opened on the bottom. This is pretty similar to what we see in lizards, and it very easily could have evolved multiple times. And in fact, based on the genetics again, that's probably what happened. This would have been an early branching archosauriform and started to lose its fenestra as it started to specialize more for its particular lifestyle. And just again, on the subject of that lower fenestra, I do want to point out, while lizards oftentimes do have this arch on the bottom part of their skull that is where that fenestra used to be, their closest relatives, the tuataras, don't have that arch. So again, something that very much changes in different reptile groups and can change seemingly fairly rapidly. Throughout these three taxa though, you can actually kind of map out how different changes to the body would have happened. For example, the starting of the expanding of the ribs and eventual fusion of the ribs. For example, you can see in Odontochelis very distinctly that it has this gastralia basket, essentially the bottom part of the plastron, the shell, that is fused together. So it really does seem like it's doing what we would expect of early turtles. Other studies have also been able to look at isotopes in Odontochelis. What they're able to find is, hey, this thing very much seems like it was living in the water, potentially eating a lot of marine plants. And this is actually really similar to what we see in modern day animals, most notably the marine iguana. Also a few other fully marine turtles. So it seems like at least Odontochelis may have actually already been totally marine, which does suggest potentially the first turtles were more water loving animals despite the fact that Unotosaurus came from the Karoo Basin, which would have been fairly dry at the time. What this means is potentially early turtles were, like Unotosaurus, living in more dry areas. However, once they found more wet areas, that more rigid body from the early start of the shell helped them to really excel in those environments. That doesn't mean they couldn't be Procolophonids or closely related to the Procolophonids, though, because at least one Procolophonid, Candelaria, did re-evolve a diapsid condition with those fenestra on the skull. So again, lots of changes can happen to the skull, but based on what we're seeing here, it seems like they were more marine, which does help to discount the Procolophonid idea, and really does also help to support the idea that, yeah, they were probably close related to the Archosauriforms. Regardless though, the group became very successful very quickly, which also kind of helps to hinder some of their evolution, because they just diversified so quickly. Unotosaurus comes from South Africa, Papakalis comes from Germany, and Odontokalis comes from China. 
just a few million years after this, in the southern part of the United States, you'll get things like Chinle Calis. And then you get Proganochalis, also coming from Germany. We also have a lot of very early archosaur fossils coming from the southern continents, so potentially they are just early archosaurs. In fact, the first early archosaur, Euparcaria, comes from South Africa as well. And so Unotosaurus may have split off just before that and been an archosauriform, not directly super, super close to things like crocodilians and birds, but still fairly close. So what the argument really comes down to for what happened with turtle evolution is really just a matter of opinion almost. Essentially, how much do you trust molecular genetics to be able to answer the question? And I personally tend to trust them a lot. There's been a lot of work done with molecular genetics in many different groups, and oftentimes it predicts things like very early fossils. For example, lizards and rhynchocephalians, the group that would lead to the Tuatara, are estimated by genetics to have split off about 200 to 230 million years ago. And when do we start finding the first fossils of those groups? About 225 million years ago, including some coming from the same places as some of these turtles. So it was a very important time for the diversification of reptiles. And seemingly that's what happened with the turtles too, is they started to diversify very heavily in the Triassic, despite potentially having their origins just before that. The Chinle Calis paper that I mentioned earlier does talk a little bit about this though, and essentially says, hey, you're using the entire genome, and so much of that is redundant that it's going to cause a lot of false positives. Essentially, it's going to make it seem like they're more closely related to the archosaurs than they actually should be. I personally don't agree with this kind of sentiment, because we've done this kind of molecular genetics with many other groups, and the fossils we're finding from those groups help to support that molecular genetics. And with the addition of things like Papocalus, Unotosaurus, and Odontocalus, it really helps to see, like, yeah, no, these are stem turtles. This is when turtles started to diverge from the other reptiles. And that realistically, yeah, they are very closely related to the archosaurs and potentially even things like the plesiosaurs. Unfortunately, both of those groups are so derived and different, it's hard to know for sure, especially when you're looking at the plesiosaurs as being a very specific group that came out of things like nothosaurs. And that's really unfortunate because many of the fossils that we would hope to find come from the time just after that Permian-Triassic extinction, and the world was pretty barren. We don't have a ton of fossils there. Hopefully somebody will find some though, and that'll just really help answer this question, so that way we can know what the heck was going on with turtle evolution. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I could do a whole separate thing on just modern day turtles and how they showed up. There's, there's a lot going on with turtle evolution that's very interesting. Hopefully we find some better fossils of some of these early ones so we can really narrow down what happened in their early evolution. It's nice doing a video that's a little different for a what the hell, where I'm sitting here talking instead about a specific organism, talking about an entire group evolving. So be sure to let me know if you like these kinds of videos where I delve into a, just a single subject a little deeper as opposed to just one animal. I think it's really useful to kind of summarize that for some of these groups because they are goofy. With all that said, be safe, take care, don't go extinct. Don't forget to impact that subscribe button like you're the Chicxulub Crater. Yeah.